to be reversible is when the right-hand side refers to the left-hand side. So basically the same reason. As a result, we cannot know anything about, in this case, y before line 2. So as a result, we can say pre-2 is, oh, uh, we have to forget what we know about y, so the only thing we can keep is x equals to k. Are we okay so far? Okay, so we, we keep forgetting stuff as we walk our way back because both line 2 and line 3 are not reversible. There's no way for me to know the values of the variables involved before those lines. Okay, line 1, so now you can also do the same thing here. Post 1 equals pre-2 because they are in a sequence. And now we can explain what, what is line 1. Line 1 is an operation that is reversible. Okay. In other words, if I know after line 1 x equals to k, and all line 1 does is to add 1 to the value of x, what is x before line 1? x equals k minus 1. Okay, So you can just reason it out like that, and you can say since after the line x equals to k, x must be k minus 1 before the line which adds 1 to x. Okay, Or something along that line. And as a result, you can say pre-1 is x equals to k minus 1. So that's one approach. The other approach is to say, I have a strong suspicion that the precondition of everything is really just x equals to k minus 1. Okay? Now, based on that assumption, you can move forward. And if you do move forward with only this assumption, the pre-1 equals k, uh, x equals k minus 1, then by the time you get to post-3, you get the same post-3 as in the question itself. So that's also another approach to do it. Okay. Any questions about that? So I think question number four is probably one of the harder questions you know, to get you know, points for. But the other one, number three, is the easier one. So we have one really easy question that only has 10 points, and one kind of harder one that also has 10 points. They kind of cancel out each other. Any questions about this? Does anyone want to be, want to be reminded of all the letter grade boundaries? Like if you want to know what letter grade you're getting for this exam, you know, which points, what are the point value ranges? Yeah? Okay. I can do it with a spreadsheet. I don't like to do arithmetic stuff. <clears throat> okay, so we start with point 0.125, and then the next one is point 0.375. The nice thing about spreadsheets is they kind of understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so once I give it two values and I say, oh, go by the same increment, it actually understands what those increments are. And I want to insert a new row like that. Um, so in this column here, I will specify the, the point values. So in this case, it has 60 points for the total. And now I can say this one is A2 times B$1. I'm just being very lazy. So these are all the boundaries. Anyone with seven with less than 7.5 points out of 60, we get an F. People who are getting between 7.5 but less than 22.5 points, we get a D. So to pass this class, someone will need to have 22.5 points or more to get a C out of this test. 37.5 points or more is a B, and 52.5 points or more is an A. I think that's it's not easy to fail these tests. I, I would say it's, you, someone can still fail the test, but it, it's not easy. I mean, if you think about it, question number three, all by itself, is 10 points, right? So that immediately puts someone into a range of D. <laughs> Just by answering one question, the easy one. And D is not failing, by the way. 
Did you guys know that? Do you guys know the the meaning of the grades? A is what? A is excellent. B is good. C is actually satisfactory. Believe it or not, C is satisfactory. D is unsatisfactory but not failing, and F is the only failing grade. Unfortunately, universities don't look at it that way. <laughs> If you get like straight all C's, you know, in a in a transcript, the university will not say satisfactory. They will say it's not satisfactory. <clears throat> It is called grade inflation. Okay, so do we have any questions about letter grade equivalence of this test? How many points is there in Amor? <laughs> If it's missing, then it's worth nothing. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay. Well, it's going to take me a while to grade it because of all the way that I'm breaking it down for partial credit. You know, partial credits are really hard you know, on the instructor you know, or the per person who is grading it. Okay. Any other questions about the test? Yep. Moodle, yes. <clears throat> I will give the test back to you. The physical test will be handed back to you, um, and the grade will be posted in Moodle as well. Yep. Any other questions? No other questions. Well, as I said a little bit earlier, today would be a good day to take roll. We haven't done that for a long time. Do it. And we'll see how many people are on the roster but not here today. Oh, it's complaining I didn't fill in this part here. <clears throat> okay, let's try to be quick here. Tamer, I don't think he's here, or he or she. I got an email. You know, uh, this person was involved in an accident and could not arrange a ride to, to school. So, um, <coughs> Dion, Dion Bell, okay. Clark, here. thank you, and here, Stanton, here. thank you. William Childs, Here. thank you. Colton, Here. thank you. Nicholas, here. thank you. Isaac, is not here. Mark, here. thank you. Alexi, here. thank you. Elizabeth, not here. Andrew, Andrew Francis. Not here, Stephen. Here. Thank you, Angelina. Here. Thank you. Um, here. Is that here or not? Oh, yep. Okay. Double checking. Here. Thomas. Here. here. Kirtland. Here. Adrian. Here. Thank you. Chris Martin. Not here, Russell. Thank you. Um, Karen? I think she's missing. She's usually at the front. <coughs> Teresa? Okay. Finn? Okay. Troy? Here. Thank you. Here. Okay, thank you. Dominica? Thank you. Oh, yeah. I think she's over here. Oh, okay. Andrew? Is Andrew here? Hello. Fabian? Okay, Fabian. Kept mispronouncing it. Samuel? Here. Okay, thank you. Mew? No. Absent. Monique? Here. Thank you. Roman? Thank you. Taryn? Here. Thank you. And 
Mohammed Tahir we're seeing here. Bernadette is here Joseph Joseph White not here Christopher Wright thank you and Crystal is here excellent so what I'll do is I'm going to see if there's any correlation between absences and the result of the midterm <clears throat> And then I will just, you know, kind of mention to people who are missing you from the class and say, well, you know, <clears throat> it may be in your best interest to drop the class. If there's a correlation, of course. Okay. Are there any questions before we move on? Are we done with pre and post conditions? We won't see that again until the final exam. <laughs> so it will come back. It will come back, but only in the final exam. If you are a programmer or planning to become a programmer or a, a computer scientist or pursue a career career in, in that area, the pre and post conditions won't come back at all in the form that we talk about in the class. But the skills that you use to analyze your program, that you truly understand what it means, okay, when I'm here, this is the condition, can I get go back in time and deduce the conditions earlier on? Those skills will still be useful in debugging a program, okay? So I just want to make sure that you guys understand that the pre and post conditions by themselves are not as useful, but the skills that you, under, you, you demonstrated or that you learn when you're dealing with pre, pre and post conditions will be useful. So after that, we are now on to top-down design, and I cannot remember how much we got into it. I think I used Google Map to demonstrate you know, the whole idea of top-down design. <clears throat> and I also mentioned the fact that top-down design is not because of the, limit of the limitation of the computer. The computer can handle a lot of details you know, at the same time. If you look at databases, it can deal with millions or even billions of entries without you know, making any, a single mistake. But how many things can you remember at a, single, at a particular time? How many phone numbers can you memorize, like given 30 seconds? <laughs> phone numbers or IP addresses, that sort of thing. Not a whole lot. That's why we have domain names instead of using IP addresses, right? So that tells you how much of why we have top-down design. It is because the human mind cannot keep track of so many things all at the same time. And as a demonstration or to illustrate how this approach works, um, we are going to use an example and it's kind of funny because my my fifth grader is doing that sort of math today okay have you guys read this chapter and know what kind of math we're dealing with what are we dealing with here uh, factoring numbers right now did we talk about how to factor a number no okay so we should start with that <clears throat> All right. So the, the example I used to illustrate top-down design was to use, you know, factoring, okay? Factoring is pretty easy. 72 is 2 times 36, so 2 is a prime factor. But we're not done yet because 36, you know, may be broken down, you know, it may be a composite number. So then we say, what is 36? Well, 36 is easy. It's 2 times 18. 2 is a prime factor. What is 18? Is 18 a prime number? Eh, not yet. Okay, it is three times six. Okay, well, this time I think of three. The order is not important. I just want to, you know, make sure I can list all the prime factors of a number. And now we have six here. Six is two times three, so two is a prime number. Now we are down to three. Three is a prime number itself, so the only way I can say this is a product of something is to say it is a product of itself and one. And now we're down to one, and we know that we are done. Because one is not a prime number. And it is by definition. By definition, one is not a prime number.